While most adventures occur on worlds below the sky, some occur above in the stars. The empty vacuum of space is ironically filled with threats and horrors. When a cosmic enemy threatens to destroy their world, brave heroes must do everything in their power to save it. Spelljammers Light of Zarixis will take you across the teeming oceans of wild space to the silvery void of the astral sea and beyond. Along the way, you'll make friends, encounter terrifying foes, and face one cliffhanger after another. Can you save your world before time runs out? Dungeons & Dragons Light of Zarixis is inspired by the 1980 film Flash Gordon and serialized Flash Gordon comic strips from the 1930s. The adventure's heroes, like Flash Gordon himself, must defeat otherworldly foes to save their home planet. Campy supporting characters, implausible situations, and over-the-top dialogue help push the story toward its inevitable conclusion. Absurd plot twists undercut the sense of urgency, keeping the heroes on their toes as they stumble from one cliffhanger to the next. Follow me as I walk you through the story of Spelljammers Light of Zarixis. Chapter 1 Astral Rain Your adventures have taken you to a coastal community where local fishing boats share the harbor with trade vessels from far and wide. Lately, everyone has been discussing the deluge of falling stars that has lit up the evening sky for the past several nights. You are just finishing your midday meal while listening to a blacksmith tell about being awakened last night by a loud crash. According to the smith, a crystalline vine burst out of the ground and punched a hole through the roof of his neighbor's bakery. Suddenly, the earth shakes violently beneath your feet. The smith and several others hurry outside. Joining them, you see sinuous, crystalline vine erupting from the ground a few blocks away. A female sailor standing in your midst says, I think it's time I return to my ship. You're welcome to join me. You would be wise to flee as well. With that, she makes her way towards the dock. Seeing the destruction unfold in front of you, you decide it may be best to heed the sailor's advice. Pushing past debris and carnage, you finally arrive at the docks. The scene here is chaotic. Hundreds of people swarm the piers, trying to push their way onto three vessels that haven't yet set sail, two longships and a galleon. A group of thugs in black leather armor use their clubs on a crowd of screaming commoners, keeping the people away from the ships as they're loaded with cargo under the supervision of a sneering man with long red hair. A woman steps out of the crowd and wipes blood from her chin. Glad to see you again, she says with a smile. I'm Captain Elena Sartell, and one of those ships is mine. Pity I can't reach it. Would you be good enough to help me? I promise to return the favor. You agree and approach the large galleon known as the Moon Dancer. As chaos ensues in the background, you engage the thugs in battle and eventually defeat them. Once the thugs are defeated, the Moon Dancer takes aboard the rest of the citizens gathered at the docks before shoving off. From the harbor, you can see crystalline vines miles from the settlement, having burst out of the world and reaching the sky. As the Moon Dancer clears the harbor, Captain Sartell stamps her boot hard on the deck. Flapjack! She yells. Take us up! Suddenly. The galleon lists and creaks as it rises out of the water and into the air. The world falls away beneath you as the moon dancer flies through the clouds and into the starry abyss of night. Chapter 2 Attack of the Star Moth Standing on the deck of the moon dancer, you see scores of crystalline vines erupting from the surface of your world, some of the vines reaching high enough to break through the clouds. You find yourself sailing through a void filled with colorful gases and blinking stars. Welcome to Wild Space, says Captain Sartell, sweeping her arms wide. That was a close thing down there. Blast if I know what those vines are, or how to get rid of them, but somebody on the Rock of Brawl might. Captain Sartell operates out of the Rock of Brawl as a privateer under the commission of the city's ruler, Prince Andrew. Along with her is the ship's spelljammer, a flump named Flapjack. Captain Sartell assures you that you'll be safe at the Rock of Brawl and sets the ship's sail towards it. As the ship makes its journey, it slows as another vessel comes into view. The pursuing vessel looks like a giant moth with wings made of crystal, similar in color and luster to crystalline vines that ravish your world. This ship is known as the Dark Star. Astral Elves, curses Captain Sartell. 
and they don't look friendly. Best ready yourselves for a fight. As the Dark Star closes in, it opens fire before reaching a distance in which three Astral Elves board the Moondancer. They demand that Captain Sartell surrenders, but she politely declines the Space Invaders. Not too pleased with the rejection, the Elves engage you and the Captain, but you prove to be victorious. Capturing the Astral Elves, you pry the following information from them. The Astral Elves, by order of Emperor Zavon of the Xarixian Empire, are responsible for dropping astral seeds on your home world. The leader of the astral forces in this wild space system is Commander Vale. Most of Commander Vale's fleet has already begun sailing back to Xarixa space. The Dark Star was left behind to monitor the astral seed's progress. The vines and astral blights will feed on the planet's energy and that of its flora and fauna until your homeworld is a dead husk, a process that takes several months. The energy then will be transmitted in a single, enormous burst of light back to the Astro Elves home system to be absorbed by their star, Xerixis. Once the Astro Steeds have begun their work, there is no way to stop the process. After learning all that you could from the Elves, you take them into your custody and abandon the Dark Star. As you continue to the Rock of Brawl, the ship slows unexpectedly. Around you, on all sides, colossal chunks of rock float in the void. Creatures resembling jellyfish and rays glide through the spaces between them. Suddenly, a vessel lurking behind a nearby asteroid comes into view. Its enormous spiral shell merges with an open bow, beneath which long tentacles wave as if caught in an invisible current. Sartell sucks her breath in through her teeth and whispers her next words, Mind Flares. Chapter 3 Treacherous Salvage as the nautilus-shaped vessel drifts closer, Captain Sartell lets out a sigh of relief. It's a derelict, she says, pointing out its stripped weaponry and broken hull. If there were mind flares aboard, they would have attacked us by now. Looks like somebody's already picked it over. Still, there might be something left worth salvaging. Captain Sartell orders Flapjack to bring her ship alongside the vessel while she designates you to board. You agree, and the Moon Dancer approaches a safe distance for you to board the ship. When you arrive on the deck, you meet a young male human in ragged, blood-stained clothes. He introduces himself as Bonotto Kralazar and explains that his nautiloid ship, known as Lucent Edict, was attacked by Niogi. Bonotto informs you that most of his crew are dead, but there are still few survivors aboard in need of healing and he begs you for help. While he may seem human, Bonotto is actually a Sirlon Ringer a descendant of a group of Sirlons that traveled with the ship's original Mind Flare crew. The Mind Flares were attacked and wiped out by the Gith Yankee, who disabled the Nautiloid and left it adrift. Human pirates found the wreck and tried to plunder it, unaware that the Sirlons left behind a hidden clutch of eggs. After hatching from their eggs, the juvenile Sirlons began preying on the pirates, killing several of them and forcing the rest to flee. One of the Sirlons then assumed the form of a pirate named Benodo Kralazar and has since been using the disguise to lure other victims onto the Lucent Edict. As you explore the ship, it doesn't take long before Benodo shows his true colors and attacks you along with other Sirlons. You slay the parasitic creatures and begin to haul off as much salvage as you can to the Moon Dancer. Just as you are making ready to leave, a dark shape glides across the face of a nearby asteroid. It is another ship. The new arrival resembles a giant spider, complete with long, delicate legs and web-like rigging. Starlight gleams off its metallic hull as it creeps silently towards your vessel. A night spider, shouts Captain Sartell. The Niyogi were using this hulk as bait, and we've flown right into their web. Chapter 4, A Friend Indeed As the night spider approaches the moon dancer, the Niyogi begins to board your ship with ill intent. Suddenly, two galleons glide into view and begin pummeling the Night Spider with ballista bolts, forcing it to break off its attack and make for the cover of the asteroids. The newly arrived space galleons are under the command of a Githyanki buccaneer named Darvik. Darvik asks Captain Sartell where the Moondancer is headed to, and she tells him that the Moondancer is headed to the Rock of Brawl. He offers to provide an escort, which Sartell promptly accepts. You set off into the starry skies once more, this time finally arriving to the Rock of Brawl. Sunlight illuminates the rooftops and spires of a city built across the top of a gigantic asteroid. 
The asteroid's underside has structures as well, including fortresses and giant sails. The wooden docks protrude from one end of the asteroid, and a variety of ships are moored there. Pier workers stand ready to catch ropes and tie off the ship as it glides alongside one of the docks and slows to a stop. Welcome to the rock, says Captain Sartell. This is where we part ways. Captain Sartell urges you to seek out Commodore Crux. He is a gif who has clashed with astral elves in the past and who might be able to help you plan your next move. Sartell knows that Crux can usually be found at the Happy Beholder, a popular tavern. You set forth into the town and eventually to the doorsteps of the tavern. A large, spherical creature with eye stalks and a watchful central eye tends the bar in this establishment. Filling one side of a table meant for six is a broad-chested, hippo-headed man. The haggard figure squints at you over the top of an enormous tankard, then waves invitingly to the seats across from him. He introduces himself as Commodore Crux. Crux has spent the last few years working as a mercenary on and around the Rock of Brawl, but lately, the GIF has been spending more time in his cups as new jobs have become fewer and farther between. You describe to him what has happened to your home world, and his eyes brighten. Crux excitedly offers to help you, stating, A fleet of astral elf ships visited the Rock of Brawl a few days ago before launching the attack on your world. The elves gave fair warning to various captains on the rock, urging them to steer clear of your world lest their ships be fired upon. The elves undoubtedly left spies behind to make sure their warnings were heeded. Best we continue this chat aboard my ship. On the way to his ship, a group of astral elves ambush you and attack in revenge for the Dark Star. You fend them off the best you can and rush the rest of the way to the docks. Stately galleons, sleek cutters that resemble flying fish, and warships built to look like hammerhead sharks line the docks of Brawl. Crux waves his arm towards a craft that seems modest by comparison. The ship's sails are patchworks of mended canvas, while its hull seems barely held together by thick vines that bind it like rope. Its strangest feature is the full-grown tree that sprouts from the deck. The second wind, Crux declares pridefully. Isn't she something? The second wind is a living ship equipped with two jolly boats called Little Boom and Big Bluster. As you and Crux board the vessel, you are accosted by its current captain, Fel Ardra, a typhling who has been renting use of the ship from Crux. Fel is arrayed at Crux because she still has 40 days left on her lease, and the typhling is preparing to undertake a big job when you arrive. She is a capable spell jammer who, under different circumstances, could make a comfortable living selling her services to other captains. As it happens though, the Typhling has turned to smuggling to make enough coin to buy her way out of an infernal contract she entered many years ago. Although Crux doesn't approve of Fel's line of business, the GIF has had a soft spot for her ever since the two met. Fel sees their relationship as purely transactional, but Crux is convinced the Typhling has a heart of gold and he keeps trying to persuade her to give up smuggling. Now, with your arrival, Crux envisions the makings of a grand adventure. One, he hopes that he can convince Fel to join. Fel is indifferent to your plight, and says that if Crux wants his ship back ahead of time, he'll have to refund the rest of her lease payment. Crux says he is prepared to pay her back. Fel, however, can sense the gift's desperation, so she insists on being compensated for the lost revenue of her next venture. Fel is bluffing. The Typhling secretly reckons she would be lucky to clear 1,000 gold pieces but she has always suspected Crux of having deep pockets and has no qualms about trying to gouge him. In truth, Crux has squandered most of his money and can barely afford to return the balance of Fel's lease payment, let alone pay the extra amount she's demanding. Fel is willing to accompany you in exchange for a 25% share of any treasure you find until she is paid in full. Finding there to be no other option, you agree and now have yourself a spell jammer. The first mate of the second win is the Hazodi, whom Crux refers to as Mr. Flinch. The Hazodi is also a skilled seamster, the repairs to the ship's sails are his work. Flinch is an old comrade in arms of Commodore Crux and stands by the gift through thick and thin. Flinch has spent the last several months keeping an eye on the ship for Crux while serving in Fel's crew. He is relieved to have Crux back on board and glad to see his friend in such high spirits though his private worry is that if their upcoming mission should fail, that might be more than the old soldier could bear. The tree rooted to the second wind's stern castle is a treant named Starbow, who is largely indifferent to the aims of either you or Crux. 
Like many of its kind, the Treant considers most humanoid problems to be fleeting affairs and takes a much longer view of life. Once you are aboard the Second Wind and safely off the Rock of Brawl, Crux reveals his plan to you to travel to another wild space system called Doom Space, where enemies of the Xerixian Empire are assembling a coalition. Crux believes that your only hope of saving your planet lies in joining the coalition. He doesn't know much about Doom Space though, so the ship's immediate destination is a lonely tower on an asteroid where a wizard cartographer named Topola lives. Topola is Crux's friend, and he's certain that she will be able to provide him with a map of Doom Space. Having a new venture to occupy his thoughts lifts Crux's spirits. The gift stops drinking and moves about his ship with purpose and authority, barking out orders like the military commander he once was. Any time the conversation turns to Crux's history with the Xarixian Empire, however, the gift becomes quiet and brooding. It's obvious there is painful memory Crux doesn't feel comfortable sharing yet, muttering, things are bound to turn out differently this time. With a crew and a destination, the ship lifts up out of the docks and into space. When leaving the orbit of the asteroid, your voyage is met with resistance nearly immediately. Closing in from behind is a gigantic, bioluminescent jellyfish-like creature known as an aesthetic with a flamboyantly dressed figure standing inside its glassy dome. A magical doorway appears on the main deck of your ship. The flamboyantly dressed figure steps through it, brandishing a trident, and the doorway closes behind him. Heading to Topola's tower, are we? I don't think so. My friends in the Xarixian Empire don't want you meddling in their affairs. But forgive me, I haven't introduced myself yet. My name is Hastain. When the elves came looking for a suitable world to nourish their dying star, I suggested yours. It isn't every day I get to witness the destruction of a planet. I promise, it will end beautifully, even if you're not alive to see it. A fight immediately engages, and you manage to slay Hastain. Unfortunately, the spell jamming helm becomes temporarily disabled as a casualty of battle. You have won a victory, but at what cost? Chapter 5 Living on the Edge With the disabled spell jamming helm, you can't do much but just drift in the starry skies. An hour after the fight, you encounter a pod of Kandori flying across the space along a migration route. Commodore Crux encourages you to flash or wave a light to get the pod's attention, which causes a few Kandori to approach. Taking advantage of the opportunity, you lasso the Kandori and use them to guide your ship wherever you need it to go. With the help of the Kandori, you arrive at Topolas Tower, after which the Kandori resume their migration. A crooked tower perches atop a small asteroid, surrounded by a cloud of twinkling cosmic dust. Through his spyglass, Crux examines the rock upon which the tower stands and the decrepit wooden pier that juts from one side of it. Mr. Flinch, he says, ready the jolly. You and Crux board the jolly boat and head towards the dock of the tower. A woman with frayed robes and bare feet sits in a rocking chair at the base of the tower, her face half hidden by a wide brim hat. The woman leaps to her feet at the sight of the ship. She introduces herself as Topola. Topola is elated to receive visitors, especially since one of them is her old friend Crux. After welcoming the two of you to her tower, Topola insists on showing you her abode. Finishing her tour, Topola declares that she is ready to talk business. She starts the conversation with, what brings you to my tower? When she finds out that Crux was expecting her to have a map of Doom Space, Topola reluctantly says she doesn't have one. But to take its place, she is willing to part with the Wild Space Orrery. In exchange, she asks you to agree to dispose of a void scaver prowling around her tower. You promise to take care of the business and she hands over the Wild Space Orrery. Topola explains how it works. This gizmo shows you where you are in relation to the planets, moons, and sun in the wild space system, but you must be in wild space to use it. To get to another system, you must first enter the Astral Sea, which will take you to wherever you want to go. Once you reach your destination, use the Ori to get your bearings. You leave her tower on your jolly boat, and she wishes you luck saving your world from annihilation. As the jolly boat approaches the second wind, an enormous, jet-black behemoth glides out of the darkness and cosmic dust, its red eye glowing brightly as its jaws open wide. Long, stringy strands of saliva break off into weightless globs as the ravenous monster descends from above. 
It attacks the ship, but its strike is met with a crew's defense. Slaying the creature causes a cosmic storm to engulf Topola's tower. After the incident with the Void Scaver, it dawns on Topola that she might know someone willing to help you further. She casts Fly on herself and lands on the deck of the Second Wind. Topola offers to introduce you to a potential ally, Grimzod Garganhail. Grimzod is a pirate who has fought many battles against Astral Elves. Grimzod and Topola had a tryst that never amounted to much and ended with a peaceful breakup. He has a small fleet of ships nearby and might be persuaded to help you due to a favor he owes Topola. Topola doesn't mention that in the years following their breakup, Garganhail met his mortal end and rose again as a vampire. Topola fears that the crew of the Second Wind might be discouraged by learning this fact before they meet Garganhail in person. If she's asked about it, Topola doesn't divulge why their relationship fell apart, but she's quick to point out that she ended things with Garganhail, not the other way around. You accept Topola's offer to lead you to Garganhail's fleet, and she attunes to the spelljamming helm of the Second Wind. With the spelljamming helm back online, Topola pilots the ship with precision, grumbling occasionally about the vessel's lack of a battering ram. Dead ahead, you see a cloud of debris that appears to be the drifting wreckage of several ships. Crux shouts, Two arms! Peering through his spyglass, he adds, Looks like three flying fishes, three lampreys, two squid ships, and two star moths. Topola recognizes the many ships. They account for roughly half of Garganhale's fleet. She is quick to add that Garganhale's flagship, a space galleon called the Last Breath, is not among the wreckage. After the second wind passes through the wrecked ships, a tiny ball of light appears over the bow of the ship. It quickly flies around the mass and settles a few feet above the main deck, changing colors as it hovers in place. In a soft voice, it says, Lost, are we? Maybe I can be of assistance. It offers to guide the second wind to the location where Garganhale's fleet typically regroups. When questioned, the will o admits that Garganhale made the mistake of attacking a star moth a while back. Since then, the Astral Elves have been aggressively attacking Garganhale's fleet. The will o knows that Garganhale is always looking for new ships to join his force, which is why it wants the second wind to travel to Garganhale's rendezvous point. After a day's travel, you are caught in a cosmic storm. Lightning flashes through dense blue and purple clouds, illuminating the silhouette of a galleon with torn flapping sails. Ghastly figures stand on deck and cling to the rigging, staring at you with unblinking eyes. When the ships are within 50 feet of each other, the galleon's captain steps into view. A pallid, white-haired man with a barred metal mask covering the lower half of his jaw. His left hand detaches at the wrist, skitters up his arm to his shoulder, and waves at you with his finger. Crux nears at the sight and keeps one hand on his holstered pistol. Vampirates, he hisses. Chapter 6 Grave Alliance The undead captain places his boot on the rail along the deck of his creaky galleon and leans over the bow. His disembodied hand perches on his shoulder, and lightning from the cosmic storm flashes behind him. Garganhale's tone of voice is inviting, but his dead black eyes glint with malice. It's dangerous out here. That menace from Xerixis, Commander Vale keeps sending ships to our system, but we do our part to thin the Astral Elves' ranks. You're obviously not with them. Care to identify yourselves? With Topola in sight, Captain Garganhale's posture briefly slumps like that of a wounded animal. He then puffs out his chest, raises an eyebrow in her direction, and adds the following. Do my lifeless eyes deceive me? Topola, my darling, what a surprise. If you come to drive a stake through my heart, you'll have to return it first. After making introductions, the vampire captain confesses that his flagship and its crew are all that remains of his fleet. The rest fell prey to ships under the command of Vale, whom Garganhale calls the scourge of pirates, raiders, and anyone else who refuses to bow to the might of Xerixis. Garganhale wants to see the Xerixian Empire crumble, but he's wary of embarking on a voyage to Doomspace alongside a bunch of nobodies. Once Garganhale is off his ship, you try to coax the vampire captain into joining your cause. Noticing Topola, Garganhale pledges to help you save your world from destruction, asking for nothing in return. Garganhale bows deeply and invites you aboard his ship to celebrate your alliance with a bottle of champagne. But before you can take him up on his offer, Garganhale is betrayed. The last breath turns tail and flees, leaving its captain behind. Garganhale's dark eyes widen, then narrows. 
What's this foul treachery? He hisses. Unbeknownst to anyone aboard the second win, a ghost from Garganhale's crew named Agony has taken possession of Flinch. As Garganhale bellows a curse at the dwindling stern of his ship, Flinch approaches the vampire captain with glazed eyes and a dreamy smile. In a voice dripping with sarcasm, Flinch says, Captain Garganhale, your command of the last breath is at an end. We've had enough victory at your hands to last ten lifetimes. The Hazardee then shudders as a horned ghost vacates his body. Flinch blinks his eyes back into focus, then says in a normal voice, Do I smell smoke? Garkenhale encourages you to give chase, saying, Aboard my ship is a weapon you can use against the Xerxian Empire. Help me retake the last breath, and the weapon is yours. Alarmed at the mutiny, you pursue the last breath, which disappears into the cosmic storm. The vampire captain drops to his knees and traces a pattern on the deck with his right hand. A shimmering wave of magical energy washes over the ship. Garganhale then cackles in triumph. We are invisible. They won't see us coming until it's too bloody late. The ship speeds off into the cosmic storm and you are able to sneak up behind the last breath. Once close enough, you and Garganhale board the ship with haste. The two of you dispatch the treacherous crew members and kill all of those who betrayed Garganhale. Down in the brig, you find an elf that lies unconscious on a cot. She is clad in an ornate black dress accented with silver and gold. A high collar rises behind her head. Garganhale says, Here's the weapon I promised you. I liberated her from a star moth we destroyed a few days ago. Waking the sleeping elf, she rises too in a groggy state. The elf's gold pupils twinkle as she speaks in a superior tone. I am Princess Zadali, daughter of Emperor Zavan, and heir to the throne of Xerixis. Chapter 7 Trust Issues You return to your ship, bringing along Princess Zadali. Zadali is initially friendly towards you. You tell her of the attacks on your world, and she shares the following information with you. We both want the same thing. Revenge. As my father lies on his deathbed, my scheming brother, Zaleth, denies me my birthright. He seized control of my father's navy, banished me from court, and left me in the clutches of his psychophants. He orchestrated the attack on your world, bombarding it with astral seeds harvested from Xerixis, our dying star. Once the crystal vines had drained all the energy from your world, they would discharge that energy and a beam of light back to Xerixis, replenishing it. Zealoth instructed his minions to deposit me on your world so that, as I died, my energy could contribute in a small way to the light of Xerixis. Fortunately for me, my ship was disabled and boarded by vampires. Help me become Empress and I will undo the damage Zealoth has already caused your world. The princess also tells you that Zadali and Zealoth were meant to share the throne upon the death of their father, Emperor Zavan. The death and funeral of the Emperor are the final stages in his ascension to godhood. His dying wish was that he become one with the light of Xerixis when the star is at its brightest. That wish prompted Zealous attack on your world. The only way to save your world is to destroy Xerixis, the star at the heart of Xerixis space. If the star dies, the crystal vines on your world die as well. A member of the Imperial family can destroy Xerixis by performing a ritual at the Astral Font in the Temple of Light which is located in the Imperial Fortress. The Imperial Fortress will orbit Xerixis until Emperor Zavan ascends to Godhood, after which the Fortress will return to the Astral Sea. After conversing with Zadali, you find Commodore Crux sulking by himself. You ask Crux why he's sulking and he reveals the source of his shame. Long ago, the Commodore tried to destroy the Imperial Fortress in the Astral Sea, but his fleet was routed by the Elven Armada. Crux's flagship was one of a handful of vessels to escape, though only after it suffered terrible damage from Prince Zala's Solar Dragon Mount. Crux lost many comrades that day, and his hatred of the Xerixian Empire is equaled only by his disgust at his own cowardice and failure. You cheer him up, and raise his spirits, vowing for him to get his revenge. Once his spirits are raised, Crux shares the following information. He plans to locate his former adjutant, an old gift comrade in arm named Warwick Blastamoth, who left for Doom Space to join the Coalition months ago. Crux and Warwick used to communicate regularly by using Sending Stones, but Crux lost his stone on the Rock of Brawl a few days before you encountered him. When the two Gif last spoke, Warwick was in Doom Space, on the moon of Erun, 
entreating sentient plant creatures called Artox to join the coalition. When he arrives in Doom Space, Crux plans to use the Wild Space Orrery to locate Arun. With that in mind, you decide it would be best to search out the Commodore's old friend and set off into the Astral Sea heading towards Doom Space. Soon your ship is immersed in the starry silver clouds of the Astral Sea. The trip takes 21 days before finally arriving to Doom Space. The silvery haze thins as the ship enters a system that appears to have no sun. The ship glides between colossal fragments of smoky gray crystal, remnants of an outer shell of fantastic proportions. As silent and lifeless as a graveyard, Doom Space gives new meaning to the phrase, Dead of Night. After three days of travel through the labyrinth of crystal shards, you catch sight of a yawning black vortex limbed in dim light. The Wild Space Orrery shows the black vortex with two planets slowly spiraling around it. The system also has 12 moons, one close to the vortex, one orbiting each planet, and nine outer moonlets. There, says Crux, pointing at the biggest of the outer moons. Arun is just seven days away. With luck, that's where we'll find my old comrade, Warwick Blastamoth. His mission here is to create unity out of chaos, and knowing him, he's done a bang-up job. With the help of the Wild Space Orrery, you arrive at Arun in 10 days. Flashes of light on the surface of Arun can be seen from orbit. As the ship descends towards the moon, you see a wasteland dotted with pillars of rock. Arcs of lightning leap from pillar to pillar. The ship heads towards a plateau that is 100 feet tall, a mile wide, and covered with jungle foliage. Knowing the ship can't land safely, Crux gives the order for the ship to hover just above the treetops. The Hadozi releases one end of a rope ladder that extends 50 feet to the ground. The jungle below is alive with the sound of wildlife. Crux is eager for you to meet Warwick, so he insists you accompany him to the Arta camp. Once you set foot on the plateau, a shot rings out. A few seconds later, a uniformed gif bursts through the foliage with a musket in one hand and a look of panic on his face. Apologies in advance, he shouts as he makes his way to the rope ladder. Pellets of radiant light fly through the air, narrowly missing you as several starfish-like plant creatures creep out of the jungle and advance threateningly. Warwick Blastamoff is out of ammunition and in a hurry. The creatures pursuing him are the Artux. With your help, the Artux are pushed back and defeated. Once the Artux are defeated, Warwick lets out a long sigh of relief, salutes Commodore Crux, and asks, Permission to come aboard, sir? Before Crux can formally introduce Warwick to you, the earth heaves as two massive armored creatures burst from the ground. Warwick shouts, Boulettes! Chapter 8 Arena of Blood With the arrival of the Boulettes, you rush off the ground and up the ladder to the ship. Once he is safely off Arun, Warwick explains the current situation in Doom Space. My efforts to create a coalition have been unsuccessful. The factions of Doom Space have little interest in battling the Xerixian Empire, which seems only a distant threat to them. They would rather fight among themselves. You saw for yourself how prickly the Artux were. My peaceful entreaty must have offended their war gods. The only thing these factions seem to have in common is their hunger for ships, spell jamming helms, and weapons, things I cannot provide. War is everyone's native tongue here, and the ones most fluent in it are the Marcanes. The Blue Giants are making a killing by selling ships, helms, and weapons to other factions in exchange for raw mineral resources. But all is not lost. I've learned that the factions are in debt to a Marcane named Vokath. He might be willing to help us, for a price. You learn from Warwick that Vokath has a base that orbits one of the nine moons of N. Vokath enjoys blood sports, and his base houses a gladiatorial arena where champions do battle with fearsome creatures that Vokath has transported from Fyrene. Factions sends their greatest warriors to fight in the arena to get Vokath's attention, or to win supplies, weapons, or both. The three-day trip from Arun to Vokath is uneventful, and Commodore Crux spends much of his time catching up with his good friend Warwick. You observe the two gif, and notice that Warwick's mere presence raises Crux's spirits, filling the Commodore with hope and optimism. After three days, you finally arrive to Vokath. Floating above the luminous green clouds of Vokath is a structure made of gray and black stone, with large crystal formations jutting from the underside. Docks radiate outwards from a building that is capped by a crystal dome. Several ships are moored here, including a galleon and four others that are shaped like a wasp, a scorpion, a lamprey, and a bird respectively. Attached to the main building is a tower that has its own private dock near the top. 
At the end of this dock is a ship, shaped like a damselfly, its metal hull painted bright blue. Flanking this dock are two identical tall statues, each one depicting a thin, blue, well-dressed giant. Crews of wildly different creatures congregate on the docks near the ships, keeping to themselves as they wait for the next round of gladiatorial games to begin. To speak with Vokath, you first interact with one of his guards, then use their sigil tattoos to contact the Mercane and inform him of your arrival. Interested to hear what you have to say, Vokath instructs the guards to bring you to the audience chamber, where Vokath greets you. He is a slender blue giant wearing elegant robes and sits on a large throne flanked by two bodyguards. I can't say you look particularly important, drawls the Mercane. So speak, don't waste my time. Vokath is cold, smug, and oozing with pride. He knows that all factions in Doomspace compete to please him. When mentioning the conflict with the Xerxian Empire, Vokath's demeanor turns cold. This is not an event he sees as ending favorably for him. Enough with the me, 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 Vokath says. With a mean glint in his eyes, he adds, I'll arrange a private meeting for you with the faction leaders if you can survive three battles in my arena with no rest between them. Representatives of the factions will be watching, so fight well. An excellent performance might win their favor. You agree to his terms, and Vokath makes a dismissive gesture, teleporting you to the arena floor. After teleporting you to the arena floor, the Murricane instructs his guards to usher spectators out onto the surrounding balcony where they begin cheering in anticipation of the spectacle to come. You battle through an array of monsters and eventually emerge victorious. Vokath, watching from a distance, shouts, Well done! Now prepare yourselves for the Terror of Doom space! Out of nowhere, a three-foot-long, wide-eyed space guppy appears before you, wagging its tail in a friendly manner. You have a moment to assess your foe, a space guppy, before Vokath realizes, to his dismay, that he has released the wrong creature. Realizing his mistake, Vokath throws his arms into the air and says, Forgive me, let's try this again. Queen Gorma, a 100 foot long megapede appears, snaps up the puppy, and swallows it whole. The megapede isn't a picky eater and targets foes indiscriminately. You fight through one last fight, dodging and weaving through the megapede's attack the best you can. When the last arena match ends, a portion of the dome above the arena shatters, startling the spectators and causing shards of crystal to fall like rain. A serpentine dragon with nebulous wings sweeps down through the hole. Mounted on its back is an armored figure whose face is hidden behind a visor. The figure calls out, I am Prince Zealoth of the Xerixian Empire. I've come for my sister, Zadali. Surrender her to me, you rats, or be annihilated. Chapter 9 Discord and Diplomacy Prince Zealoth has made his appearance. After learning of his sister's escape from custody, Zealoth used the power of the Astral Font to cast Divination. This spell enabled him to determine the whereabouts of his sister. The young solar dragon that appeared was summoned by Zealoth using Summoned Solar Dragon. The figure riding the dragon, however, is not Zealoth himself, but an illusion of him created by Zealoth's mislead spell. The real Zealoth is safely aboard the Xerixia, one of 12 star moths surrounding the Vokath's base. The fleet is under the command of an astral elf named Vale, who also served as Zealoth's bodyguard aboard the Xerixia. Annoyed that you have brought Prince Zealoth's fleet to his doorstep, Vokath does all he can to prevent you from dragging him deeper into your conflict with the Xerixian Empire. First, he insists that you comply with Zealous demand, and then, by discouraging the Doomspace factions from doing anything that might escalate the current conflict at his base. You look to Zealoth, and ask the prince why he wants his sister. He replies, Our father is dead. When I became emperor, I want my sister present at my coronation. News of Emperor Zavin's death comes as no surprise to Princess Sadali, but she knows her brother well enough to assume he is not being entirely truthful about the rest of it. Sadali speaks up and says, Not everyone in the Xerxian Empire supports Zealous' claim to the throne. He needs me to legitimize it and prevent any unrest that might otherwise occur. No matter, I see that I have no choice but to return home with my brother. Zealous doesn't deny his sister's accusation, nor do her words change the present situation. Zadali sees no better option to accompany her brother back to Xerxes' space. She casts Mislead, turning invisible while creating a duplicate of herself. While invisible, Zadali addresses you through her illusion and praises you for your heroic attitude while discouraging you from getting involved in Xerxian politics. 
While her illusion chatters on, Zadali sneakily removes her ring of shooting stars, drops it on the sandy arena floor, and uses a sending spell to communicate the following information to you. You'll need my ring to save your world. I've dropped the ring in the sand. Keep it safe, I'll be waiting for you in a Xerixa space. After giving up her ring, Zadali moves back into the space occupied by her illusion and ends her spell, making it seem like she was there the whole time. After parting with her ring, Zadali surrenders to her brother. Once his sister is aboard the Xerixia, Zealoth orders his fleet back into Xerixa space. As long as Zadali is his prisoner, Zealoth doesn't care about what happens to her ring. Eventually, the Astra Elves leave with their prize in peace. With the threat gone, Vokath arranges a gathering in his private sanctum. This meeting is attended by you and the representatives of the five Doom Space factions. Here, you attempt to gather the help of the other factions that participate in the arena. Some of them are willing, while others are not. Regardless, you gather a coalition of allies and return to the ship, setting off into the Astral Sea. With a small fleet of your own, you set your destination towards the Rixa space. Once in the Astral Sea, the silvery fog catches the light of distant stars and coalesces into clouds. They vaguely resemble faces as inscrutable as they are enormous. Perhaps these are the visages of gods watching over you, perhaps they are merely figments of the astral pain, stray thoughts given form. None of that matters, however, as a distant roar draws your attention to one of the cloudy visages from whose mouth emerges a large red dragon. Riding the dragon is a knight clad in golden armor, their face hidden behind a fearsome visor shaped like a dragon's scowling visage. Chapter 10 Space Invaders the armored knight lifts the visor of her helm, revealing the stern visage of a Githyanki. I am Dagaz, a knight of Tunaroth, she says in a haughty tone. By order of Valakith, the Undying, Queen of the Astral Sea, I declare that you are guilty of the crime of trespassing. As your punishment, it is my solemn duty to decapitate your captain. So, which one of you dung-eaters commands this barge? After a beat, Dagaz smiles and adds, A bad joke on my part. I wish you swift passage through Her Majesty's realm. My dragon and I are hunting mind flayers. Have you seen any? You inform Dagaz that you've encountered no mind flayers. She takes you at your word and bids you a safe journey to wherever you're going. You inform Dagaz of your destination, and she tosses you a vial containing oil of sharpness, saying, Give the Xerxian Empire my regards. She and the dragon then fly away. After a bit of travel, you emerge from the silver haze of the Astral Sea and enter a wild space system illuminated by a white star. Using the wild space orrery, you plot a course to the imperial citadel of the Xerixian Empire. It is connected to Xerixis by a beam of light 300 million miles long. You are one day's travel from the imperial citadel when your fleet enters Xerixis space. When you come within one mile of the imperial citadel, you see an elegant, crystal-spired city built on the back of an asteroid shaped like a moth with shipyards sprouting from its wings. Atop the moss head stands a magnificent temple. A beam of light stretches from a crystal atop the temple toward a bright white star, Xerixis. An armada of crystal-winged ships patrols the region between your fleet and the citadel. The Xerixian armada is not expecting an attack. You decide to take advantage of the opportunity and command your fleet to attack the Xerixian ships. This proves to be a foolish attempt. While your ship manages to withstand the ties of battle, it becomes obvious that the rest of your fleet is doomed. Seeing the unfortunate outcome of this battle, you order the rest of the fleet to surrender. You watch as your allies lay down their arms. Now prisoners of the Xerxian Empire, you are taken to the Imperial Citadel to face justice. Maybe this was your plan for getting into the Citadel all along. Maybe not. Either way, all is not lost. Chapter 11 Crowning Moment As your ship draws closer to the Citadel, you can make out thousands of people in the streets. The crowds surround the temple at the citadel's peak. As prisoners, you are delivered to the Imperial Dogs. Their leader takes a step forward and says, I am Commander Coraleth. My orders are to deliver you to the Temple of Light to face the Emperor's justice. Princess Zadali sends her regards. He gives a sly look with the mention of Zadali, and the hint indicates that Coraleth is a friend. Coraleth's squad leads you through the streets of the citadel to the Temple of Light. On the way to the temple, Coraleth tells you the following information. Following the death of Emperor Zavan, 
Prince Zalif has declared that his coronation will take place after the emperor's funeral. Princess Sadali is being forced to attend her brother's coronation, even though it is the wish of many to see Sadali and Zalif coronated jointly in accordance with their father's wishes. If he becomes emperor, Zalith will have you executed without a trial. Once arriving to the temple, Korolith parts from you and wishes you good fortune in the events to come. Pushing your way into the temple through the crowd of onlookers, you see an elf priest presiding over the figure of the late emperor. The dead body floats in a pool of azure liquid with a brilliant beam of light penetrating it from above. Flanking the priest are Prince Zalith and Princess Zadali. The prince is arrayed in regal splendor, his expression of exultation, while Zadali stands stiffly regarding her brother with a look of utter loathing. Silence fills the temple as the priest raises his arms. The emperor's body, shrouded in light, rises into the beam and disappears. The emperor has ascended, the priest announces. His spirit is one with the light of Xerixis. As his firstborn heirs, Prince Zalith and Princess Zadali are both in line to rule, where Princess Zadali stands accused of treason. Are there any who would defend her claim? Zadali tries to mount her own defense, accusing her brother of trying to get rid of her and then fabricating the story of her sedition. It is obvious her words do not move the crowd, however. When Zealoth then tells of finding her engaged in a conspiracy to overthrow him, the crowd boos Zadali and calls for Zealoth to be crowned emperor. Zadali, in desperation, demands a chance to prove her innocence in a trial by combat, a request that Zealoth mocks. Only someone who bears one of the starlight rings can challenge for the right to rule, says the prince. Where is your ring, dear sister? You proclaim your challenge from the crowd, showing that you have Zadali's ring. With her ring, you argue that Zadali should be the ruler of the Xerixian Empire. Prince Zalith is arrayed and tries to refute your argument. The temple is filled with a tense series of verbal thrusts and parries from you and Zalith, with Zadali prompting you as needed to recount your various grievances against the Xerixian Empire. Zalith, however, attempts to twist every point against you. The crowd is eventually swayed in Zadali's favor. Zalith, seeing his status in danger, challenges Zadali to combat. Zadali asks you to serve as her champion, and you accept. Zalith sneers. Very well, sister. Since you won't face me yourself, I too name a champion. Bring forth the Zodar. The crowd gives a collective gasp as the guards part ranks to make way for a creature clad head to toe in a suit of obsidian armor. As it floats towards you, you realize the armor is the creature. The priest in the temple turns to face you. The Zodar has served the imperial family since the dawn of the empire. Its knowledge is vast and its will is absolute. The audience moves back as far as they can while preserving their front row views of the battle. The Zodar readies for battle and tries to knock you unconscious instead of killing you. It is successful in this fact and you are defeated at the hands of the Zodar. With the outcome leading to the rise of the new emperor, the crowd chants, All hail Emperor Zealoth! Zealoth turns to you and says, Pathetic fools, hurling yourselves into the void without the slightest inkling of who or what is out here. If you knew anything about the true nature of wild space, anything at all, you would have hidden from it in terror. Pity I can't destroy your world more than once. Chapter 12 Light of Xerixis The Zodar from the previous fight approaches you as Zealoth declares himself the new emperor of the Xerixian Empire. Unknown to Zealoth or Zadali, the Zodar was tasked by a previous emperor to help bring about the empire's destruction if ever someone of corrupt heart ascended to the throne. The Zodar believes that the time has finally come. A resounding, supernal voice issues from the Zodar, astonishing everyone. Take the Ring of Stars into the heart of the star where it was forged, and your world will be saved. At this pronouncement, golden light spills from the Zodar's eyes and washes over you, healing you fully from your last fight. The Zodar then crumbles into dust. Seeing you invigorated in this way causes all the astral elves in the Temple of Light, including Zealoth and Zadali, to wonder if the gods have forsaken them. Why else, as they see it, would the Zodar, which has defended the royal family for eons, bestow such a gift on the Empire's enemies? The Zodar's pronouncement tells you what you must do to save your world. Hurl the ring of shooting stars into the heart of Xerixis. Doing so not only destroys the star and everything else in Xerixis space, but also kills off the crystal vines threatening your world. You rush back to your ship and inform the shipmates of your plan. 
To destroy Xerixis, someone holding the Ring of Shooting Stars must travel into the heart of the star. Everyone realizes it is a journey from which there is no coming back. Seeking volunteers for the mission, an unlikely volunteer offers to do it, Grimzod Garganhale. He says, I hope you all appreciate the irony of a vampire flying into the sun. He then entrusts his severed hand to Topola, saying, Never let it be said that Grimzod Garganhale failed to give a lovely lady a hand. Once he has the ring, Garganhale enters the Astral Font's light beam. Moments later, he disappears and is gone forever. The star flares, becoming a thousand times brighter before shrinking into darkness. Shockwaves of multicolored energy expand outward from the collapsed star, threatening all in their path. The shockwaves destroy everything in Xerixis space, but don't extend into the Astral Sea. You and your allies hurry in a haste to travel to the Astral Sea before the shockwaves can catch up with you. Barely making it out, you float into the Astral Sea after having saved your world and the others alike. Conclusion You return home to find that the crystal vines that were choking your world have shattered and collapsed. Among the world's inhabitants, shock at this sudden reprieve has given way to relief. The destruction of Xerixis forces what's left of the Xerixian Empire to take refuge in the Astral Sea, where the Astral Elves still have numerous ships and strongholds. Zealoth and Zadali had one clone apiece, making it likely that at least one sibling will survive, hungry for revenge. Hello everyone. Man, this is actually an adventure I was really looking forward to doing. Like, a bit of a funny story. So, uh, the adventure was released on uh, August 16th of uh, 2022. On the night of the 15th, I stayed up to like 12 in the morning, like just hitting that refresh button until I got access to it, because I really wanted to read it. Uh, you know, at 12, I, I was given access to the uh, source book, and uh, I click on the link for the adventure, and it didn't work. And I jump to the forums, I'm looking around, it seems like it's not working for like anybody. Not, not the adventure, not the uh, source material, not Boo's Menagerie, nothing. So we're all waiting, and uh, I don't know if they went to sleep, but I was up to like 3 a.m. That's when they got things resolved, or was it like 2 a.m.? Anyways, this is a bit of a fun story. If you were <laughs> if you were like me and stayed up till 12, you probably encountered the same issue. Uh, anyways, I hope you enjoyed the video. Uh, I really appreciate a like and subscribe. These do take a bit of time to make. I think for this one, I'm just like staying up to like early in the morning writing scripts and recording. And it's uh, it's like, don't get me wrong, it's hard work, but I really enjoy it. These are always fun to do. And uh, yeah, if you liked it, uh, I'd appreciate a like and subscribe. And uh, if you have any questions to let me know, if there's any adventures you want me to cover uh, and do a take of, yeah, sh uh, shoot me a message and uh, I'll see what I can do. Yeah. Anyways, hope you have a good day. Thanks.